Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack family. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 128. I've never known a king or a prince. I've never known a billionaire. I've never even known a Hollywood actor. But I have known a lot of sociopaths. The sociopaths with Crozier's are the kind we're going to talk about this week. Hey, Michael Voris here, founder and CEO of Church Militant. I want to invite you to come on over to our website, churchmilitant.com, and check out Evening News. It's our most comprehensive news show from an authentic Catholic lens, and it's live streamed every Monday through Friday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Our goal is to clear up misinformation so Catholics like you can be informed. So what are you waiting for? Visit churchmilton.com today. As I've told you before on this show, I worked in prison apostolate for many years. After all, if there's any group of people who need the salvific words of Christ and the sacramental system he established for eternal life, it's this group of men. I've known murderers, serial rapists, child molesters, arsonists, robbers, burglars, con artists, drug smugglers, and even drug dealers. I've known men who should have been on death row, but either a jury or an appeals court thought otherwise. I knew a man who cut his wife in half with a shotgun right in front of his children. He was so arrogant that he thought that what he did wasn't all that bad, and so he didn't deserve the life sentence he got. He was so sociopathic that he couldn't understand why his children, the daughters who watched him take their mother away from them, protested the granting of parole his first time. Fortunately, he's still in prison. The board listened to the daughters. I knew a man who stabbed his terminally ill mother to death, killing her in terror with what he thought was euthanasia. Well, at least his actions demonstrated what euthanasia really is. I knew another man who killed people both in Vietnam and America with his bare hands. Because he was taught that killing Charlie Kong with his bare hands was good, he thought that was what he was supposed to do to Americans when he felt threatened. Nobody bothered to tell him that's not how things are supposed to be. Nobody thought they had to. He died in prison. I knew a guy who was in prison for incest. He didn't think that the judge had any business telling him that he couldn't sleep with his daughter. I even knew a guy who was in prison for necrophilia. For those of you who don't know what necrophilia is, it's having sexual intercourse with a dead body. I've known some sick, twisted, depraved, and wicked men without a conscience. The bravest and most compassionate among you would have a great deal of trouble just being in the same room with these men, especially if you're aware of the details for why they're in prison. But this group of criminals pale in comparison to the vast majority of our incredibly evil bishops in the USCCB. The USCCB is an abomination for Almighty God, and the few faithful bishops among them need to dissociate themselves from the USCCB before they assure their own eternal damnation. The vast majority of these bishops are evil and faithless. They're cowards, liars, thieves, and they hate Christ, His Church, and they also hate you. Sure, they often make the right noises, but for most of them it's just a scam. They don't love you. They're not the least bit concerned about you. Abusing their authority, they just tell you to keep your mouth shut and not question them, pretend you're stupid, and to give them your money so they can finance their Marxism, abortion, and artificial contraception. The best proof that the hierarchy is run by evil men with murder in their hearts, from the top to the bottom, is the way Pope Frank sold out the Chinese Catholics by handing them over to the CCP for intimidation, torture, and death. The diabolical men of this country do the same thing here through their Catholic campaign for human development. As a body, they've been evil men for decades. 
They've been thieves, liars, homosexuals, and pederasts since long before the free scandal broke in 2002. But there's no working in the shadows and behind the scenes anymore. Oh no, they're putting their evil right out there for all of us to see. At the time of this recording, the USCCB is about to have their semi-annual meeting on June 16 through 18. The meeting will be virtual rather than in person for obvious nefarious reasons relating to the China virus. The number one thing on the agenda isn't a way to revive Catholic belief in the real presence or a way to educate Catholics on the constant 2,000-year teachings of the Church. After all, 74% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence, our core dogma, and 82% fully reject one or more of the 2,000-year teachings of Christ's Church. Do the bishops see these as things that should top their meeting agenda? Oh, no! They want to discuss whether they should anger their Democrat overlords by withholding communion from them for their stand on abortion, something that should have been decided 48 years ago. Although discussing abortion, there's still no mention of euthanasia, homosexuality, or transgenderism. Just abortion. And they actually have to discuss whether it's prudent and just. There was a letter to the president of the USCCB, Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles, in which the signatories urged that this discussion be put off until all of the bishops could meet face-to-face rather than virtually over the Internet. Whereas these virtual meetings seem to be the new normal, that means the issue will never be discussed by the USCCB. Why it requires discussion in the first place is beyond me, but these feckless shepherds seem to think it does. And there's something I want to point out about this scurrilous letter. It was written on May 13th. That's the day Our Lady appeared to the three children in Fatima, Portugal, with a message for the world. I don't know about you, but I never believe in coincidences. What better day to write a Satan-inspired letter intended to protect the demonic Democrat worshippers of Moloch, the god who lusts for the blood of children, than the day heaven sent us one of the most important messages since Pentecost? The signatories of this letter have come out of the closet, so to speak. No pun intended. They're no longer trying to hide and pretend that they're Catholics. Oh, they're Catholic bishops, all right, because they've received the fullness of holy orders. They're just not Catholic. Everyone needs to know who the 86 men are who signed this diabolical letter. Let's go over the list real quick, because many of you serve under these Marxist demons. The full list includes Cardinal Supich of Chicago, Cardinal Dolan of New York, Cardinal Gregory of Washington, D.C., Cardinal O'Malley of Boston, Cardinal Tobin of Newark, Archbishop Belisario of Anchorage, Juno, Archbishop Atene of Seattle, Archbishop Garcia Siller of San Antonio, Archbishop Rosansky of St. Louis, that lying pig. I can say that because I have first-hand experience with his inability to tell the truth. More on him later. Archbishop Schur of Cincinnati, Archbishop Wester of Santa Fe, Bishop Bambera of Scranton, Bishop Bartchak of Altoona Johnstown, Bishop Bigler of Cheyenne, Bishop Botan of St. George in Canton for the Romanians, Bishop Caggiano of Bridgeport, Bishop Calvo of Reno, Bishop Cahill of Victoria, Bishop Corver of Lubbock, Bishop Coyne of Burlington, Bishop DeMarzio of Brooklyn, Bishop Doherty of Lafayette, Indiana, Bishop Hicks of Joliet, Bishop Johnson of Des Moines, Bishop Kettler of St. Cloud, Bishop Kopaz of Jackson, Bishop McElroy of San Diego, Bishop McGovern of Belleville, Bishop McKnight of Jefferson City, Bishop Medley of Owensboro, Bishop Mulvey of Corpus Christi, Bishop O'Connell of Trenton, Bishop Pates, Apostolic Administrator of Crookston, Bishop Persico of Erie, Bishop Seitz of El Paso, Bishop Sis of San Angelo, Bishop Stowe of Lexington, that gay loving bishop, Bishop Taylor of Little Rock, Bishop Toops of Beaumont, Bishop Thomas of Las Vegas, 
Bishop Tilka, coadjutor bishop of Peoria, Bishop Tyson of Yakima, Bishop Vasquez of Austin, Bishop Orful of Great Falls Billing, Bishop Weisenberger of Tucson, Bishop Zinkula of Davenport, Bishop Zurich of Amarillo, Bishop Bartosik, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Bejerano, Auxiliary of San Diego, Bishop Birmingham, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Bolay, Auxiliary of San Antonio, Bishop Campbell, Auxiliary of Washington, Bishop Casey, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Cruz, Auxiliary of Newark, Bishop Dolan, Auxiliary of San Diego, Bishop Dorson Rodriguez, Auxiliary of Washington, Bishop Elizondo, Auxiliary of Seattle, Bishop Grob, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Janik, Auxiliary of San Antonio, Bishop Kelly, Auxiliary of Dallas, Bishop Lorenzo, Auxiliary of Newark, Bishop Lombardo, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Manns, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Perry, Auxiliary of Chicago, Bishop Rivetuso, Auxiliary of St. Louis, Bishop Soparito, Auxiliary of New York, Bishop Studerus, Auxiliary of Newark, Bishop Wypich, Auxiliary of Chicago. This is a genuine hall of shame. These evil bishops, like their demonic counterparts in the Democrat Party, who fail to realize that they work for us, fail to realize that this is our church. It's not their church. They're just the authoritative caretakers, a job that they miserably fail at and have betrayed with their maliciousness. As I said, now the wicked men of our hierarchy don't even try to hide the fact that they're evil men who sold out to Satan in their attempt to destroy souls and the Catholic Church from within. Another good example of their public evil is the current trend to persecute faithful priests and close thriving parishes so they can confiscate the money and pocket the proceeds from the sale of properties. Case in point. Archbishop Mitchell Rosansky, the Archbishop of St. Louis, my Archbishop. When it was announced that he'd been appointed to the Rome of the West, I began researching him. I knew long before he came here that we were in trouble. There were two things I expected to happen after Rosansky had been here for at least a year. I was wrong, though. Not about the two things he'd do, but about how long he'd be here before beginning to dismantle the Catholic Church here. He didn't wait a year, but rather only eight months. I knew that the first thing he'd do was to find a way to get rid of the extraordinary form of the Mass, the traditional Latin Mass. I was right, too. We had only three Latin Masses in this archdiocese, one celebrated by Father Raymond Hager at St. Barnabas the Apostle Church in O'Fallon, Missouri, one celebrated by the Institute of Christ the King at the Oratory of St. Francis de Sales, and one celebrated by Monsignor Eugene Morris at the Oratory of Saints Gregory and Augustine. As you'd expect a petty and cowardly bully to do, Rosansky began with his weakest link. Father Raymond Hager was that link. He's not a weak man. He just had a weakness the Marxist Rosansky could exploit. Father Hager was given St. Barnabas in O'Fallon by Archbishop Robert Carlson as a last-ditch effort to save the parish and avoid its closure. Part of the deal was that Father Hager could have his ailing mother live with him in the rectory so he could care for her. It was a win-win situation for everyone. Father Hager had taken the monstrosity of a parish church that looked more like a barn than a place of worship and turned it into a slice of heaven. It's really quite beautiful now. Father Hager was told by then-Archbishop Robert Carlson in 2013 that the church would be shut down in about five years unless he found a reason for the diocese to keep it open. In 2015, Father began to celebrate the Missa Cantata, a sung traditional Latin Mass. Average Mass attendance in the parish grew from 99 in 2017 to 165 in 2021, despite the China virus pandemic. 
The priest also began to celebrate all the weekday ordinary four masses ad orientum, which is facing God in the tabernacle instead of the people, and a year later began to celebrate all the Sunday masses ad orientum as well. Donations increased. In 2018, the parish raised $300,000 for the general fund from its offertory collection. In 2019, $290,000, down 4%. In 2020, $335,000, up 16.5% in spite of the pandemic. Also under Father Hager's leadership, for the first time in seven years, the parish received converts into the Catholic Church. All five of them were under 30 and regularly attended the traditional Latin Mass. So there was no apparent reason to get rid of Father Hager, and Rosansky would have to trump something up. Well, indeed he did. When former Archbishop Carlson gave Father Hager the parish, it was with the understanding that Father could care for his ailing mother in the rectory for the remainder of her life. Then along comes that cowardly, odiferous, bovine-like Rosansky, a Marxist prelate who wastes perfectly good air the rest of us may need one day, and tells Father Hager he has to go to another parish without his mother or take early retirement. Father obviously had to choose retirement. The reason given by Rosansky for the situation, through the equally worthless auxiliary bishop Mark Rivetuso, was that Father Hager had repeatedly disobeyed regarding making ascetic changes to the church. In an email, Monsignor Dennis Steely wrote, Father Hager was told directly not to make any changes in the church without the express permission of Archbishop Rosansky. Even if this is true, and I really doubt it because I know Rosansky, and also will never know because Father has steadfastly refused to be interviewed by anyone, that is certainly no reason to cruelly force a man into retirement over the care of his mother, especially since we have such a priest shortage in the Rome of the West. Archbishop Rosansky is just a bully, and in my experience, all bullies are cowards. This gutless wonder was so cowardly that he sent his due boy Rivetuso to do the dirty work. I suspect, because he's a coward, Rosansky couldn't bear to look Father Hager in the eye. Now that Father Hager is gone, the next Latin Mass to go will be the Institute of Christ the King at the Oratory of St. Francis de Sales. This one will also be pretty easy. When Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke was the Archbishop for St. Louis, he invited the Institute of Christ the King into the Archdiocese. He gave them an already deconsecrated church that was scheduled for demolition. The Latin Mass Order put a ton of money and work into the parish and built up a Latin-loving congregation of parishioners. But now all Rosansky has to do to get rid of them is to tell them that the Institute of Christ the King is no longer welcome in the Archdiocese. They'll have to leave, hopefully noisily, shaking the dust of St. Louis from their feet. Then Latin Mass number 2 will be history. The final Latin Mass to go will be one celebrated by Monsignor Eugene Morris at the Oratory of Saints Gregory and Augustine. Now, this one may be a little more difficult for the culprit, Rosansky. Monsignor Morris is a powerful priest in the archdiocese, and his parishioners are fiercely devoted to the Catholic Church, the Latin Mass, and fiercely loyal to Monsignor Morris. None of these people will go without a fight. Ultimately, Archbishop Rosansky will have his way because there's no mechanism in place to stop him except to sue him under canon law. That won't work either because the ultimate decision in such a case will rest with Pope Frank, and we already know what to expect there. There are a lot of other good priests being persecuted by their homosexual-loving, church-hating bishops now. It's a new trend because they know they can get away with it under Pope Frank. Some of the priests being persecuted are Father Robert Altier of Minneapolis, Father James Altman of La Crosse, Father Daniel Nolan from the North American District of the Fraternity of St. Peter, Father Paul Kouchik of Chicago, Father James Parker of Rockford, Illinois, Father Theodore Rothrock of Lafayette, Indiana, and Father Mark White of Richmond, Virginia. 
Specifically, some of the persecuting bishops are Archbishop Bernard Hebda of the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, who publicly admonished Father Altier for daring to speak out against all the tyranny of the left during the pandemic. Bishop William Callahan of the Diocese of La Crosse, who publicly rebuked Father Alton for saying in a homily that you can't be Catholic and a Democrat, and he's now trying to force Father from public ministry altogether. Cardinal Blaise Supich of the Archdiocese of Chicago, who actually forced Father Kalachik to flee for his life from Chicago for allowing his parishioners to burn a rainbow banner. Bishop Timothy Doherty of the Diocese of Lafayette, Indiana, who removed Father Rothrock for publishing an article critical of Black Lives Matter. And Bishop Barry Nestow of the Diocese of Richmond, who is trying to laicize Father White for speaking out about the handling of the sex abuse crisis in the church. All of these, and most of those in the USCCB, are the scum of the earth, worse than the violent convicted felons I served in prison apostolate. Take heart, though, because God is perfect in not only his mercy, but also his justice. In Revelation 21.8, Jesus said, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Every single bishop we spoke about here today definitely fits into four of these categories Jesus mentioned, maybe five. They may be able to get away with their evil in this life, but not in the next. And I have a message just for you bishops who are still faithful to Christ. Bishops don't like to listen to me, and I wonder why. But anyway, all of you in the six-pack family who have bishops who still believe in our holy and ancient faith, you need to do everything you can to get them to listen to at least this part of what I have to say. I don't want to name names, but I may have to at some point. Here's my message. The one part of what Jesus said that applies to your excellencies is the category of cowardice. As long as you remain in the abomination called the USCCB, you're equally culpable of the crimes of your fellow bishops because you just want to go along to get along. You're also being cowardly because you won't stand up the way a genuine successor of the apostles would and perform the two aspects of your office that you swore to Almighty God you'd do. For those of you listening who don't realize it, when your bishop was consecrated, he swore to fully perform the triple obligation of a bishop, which is to teach, to rule, and to sanctify. They all keep the rule part because they think they're just CEOs of big corporations, but every single one of them are either woefully negligent or maleficent at teaching and sanctifying their subjects. Okay, I've sufficiently raked the bishops over the coals, but we have responsibilities too. I've said it before and I'll shout it from the rooftops until I die. The church is not the bishop's church. Jesus Christ established the Catholic Church specifically for our salvation and to carry his redemptive work to others. The bishops are just the divinely appointed stewards. But because they won't do their job, it's up to us, the laity, to do everything that our state and life permits. We can't give confirmations, celebrate the Mass, hear confessions, or pass on holy orders. But we can share the faith in its fullness with everyone we meet. In fact, that's our sacred moral obligation. You can't possibly come up with any reason, what I'd call an excuse, for not sharing the faith. You can't claim you're too old. I'm an old man, and you constantly thank me for sharing the faith. You can't claim to be too young. Carlo Acutis was a 15-year-old Italian boy who died in 2006. He brought the Holy Eucharist to the world and was elevated to the honors of the altar just last year. And you're too young? Baloney. You can't claim you're in bad health. 
I'm homebound in a wheelchair and have only partial use of one arm. Yet I have a column in the Wander, write bulletin inserts for parishes, host this podcast, write books, and host weekly webinars to share the faith throughout the fall, winter, and spring. If I can do it, you can do it. You can't claim that you're not smart enough to share the faith. If you can understand what I'm saying in these episodes, you're smart enough to learn the faith well and share it. Peter was an ignorant, uneducated fisherman, but he became the first and greatest pope in church history. No, you can't come up with a reason for not sharing the faith and work to correct the evil of our bishops. The only thing you'll be able to say to Jesus at your judgment when he asks you why you didn't share the faith, especially with your ignorant brother and sister Catholics, is that you were lazy, that you really didn't love him as much as you claimed. Want proof? Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every idle word they speak. In other words, you'll pay for everything that comes out of your mouth that failed to promote Jesus and his church. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That means that eternal damnation awaits those who fail to take Jesus at his word in Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Let me ask you, is your life easy? Do you have plenty? Are you comfortable? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you aren't really living the Catholic faith. Living the faith is hard. A price has to be paid for the faith, and it usually comes with having the guts to stand up for the truth, even when you think you're all alone. That's the nature of actually living the Catholic faith. Father Altman is a good example. And do you think Archbishop Rosansky won't at least hear about the things I've said about him in this episode? I don't care what he says or does about it. My allegiance and devotion are to Jesus first, not that Marxist sellout who governs over the destruction of this beloved archdiocese. I've faced the probability of being killed for the faith, so I don't fear anything that this sniveling coward can do to me. Six-pack family, it's way past time to stand up and be the bold Catholics that the graces of your confirmation intended you to be. Email me. Comment on this episode. Reach out to me in some way. I'll help you figure out the best ways you can share the faith with others based on your natural God-given talents. As you know, I don't like asking for your financial support. I always want a win-win situation whenever possible. Well, I've got a way for you to help this apostolate without you having to do anything you're not already doing. Everybody shops on Amazon. I've developed an affiliate relationship with Amazon. When you visit cantankerouscatholic.com and click on the episodes page, blog page, or about the show page, on the right-hand side of the page you'll see Amazon ads for Catholic books and merchandise. There's no price difference from Amazon's site, but if you click on something you're interested in and buy it, Amazon will pay me a small commission just for you clicking on that ad. It doesn't stop there either. Anytime you're on Amazon and find things you want to buy, send me the link to the items and I'll send you another link to click when you're ready to buy. You won't pay a dime more for the item, but Amazon will pay me a commission. That way you can help to financially support this apostolate just by doing what you were going to do anyway. Remember, Visit the episodes, blog, and about the show pages to find Catholic books and merchandise, and send me links to other things you want to buy on Amazon, and I'll send you the links that will pay this apostle at a small commission. And I thank you in advance for your support. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to Breitbart. 
leaders of the G7 countries agreed to new targets on reducing emissions to curb climate change. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the G7 wanted to drive a global green industrial revolution to transform the way we live. The G7 leaders committed to having their emissions by 2030, relative to 2010. They also agreed to end government support for the fossil fuel sector overseas. Why, you must be delusional or something. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News Pick pick number number four. Hats off to the Washington Times. Senator Tom Cotton, a Republican from Arkansas, said he's heard from hundreds of whistleblowers in the military who object to critical race theory and privilege walks done during so-called diversity training sessions. We're hearing reports of plummeting morale, growing mistrust between the races and sexes where none existed just six months ago, and unexpected retirements and separations based on these trainings alone, said Cotton. Despicable! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number three. three. Hats off to Daily Wire. The Republican National Committee might skip the network TV presidential debates in 2024 unless there's a dramatic overhaul to the format. Conservative activist David Bossie said most network news moderators have little interest in asking questions that illuminate the debate. They're asking questions really not to impact primary voters, but to have gotcha questions and answers for the general election debate, because they all want to see their question and answer played during the general election, he writes. Let the fight begin! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number two. Hats off to Catholic News Agency. The bishops of Poland consecrated their homeland to the Sacred Heart of Jesus on the Solemnity last Friday. It was the 100th anniversary of a previous national consecration at the same location. In the summer of 1920, Soviet troops attempted to cross into Poland. Yet three weeks after the consecration, the Poles won an outstanding victory over the Red Army in the battle known as the Miracle on the Vistula. Wow! That's just incredible! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number one. one. Hats off to Catholic News Agency. There's a brand new exhibit on Bless Carlo Acutus, a teenager who has been called a modern apostle of the Eucharist. Acutus was a gamer and a computer programmer who developed an exhibit on the Eucharist before his death in 2006, at the age of just 15. That's awesome, dude! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. hard but i am fair it's time for the catholic boot camp with your drill sergeant joe sixpack the every catholic guy learn the catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before this boot camp is tough so there's no political correctness no spirit of vatican II, and no namby pamby platitudes drill sergeant joe sixpack the every catholic guy will prepare you for spiritual war now here's Joe Sixpack. Queen St. Elizabeth of Hungary, who lived from 1207 to 1231, was one of the most benevolent monarchs in the history of the world. Not content with receiving numbers of the poor in her palace on a daily basis and relieving the distress of all who she could find, she built several hospitals where she served the sick and dressed the most horrible sores and infections with her own hands. Once she was carrying in the folds of her mantle some provisions for the poor when she met her husband returning from a hunting trip with his friends. Amazed to see her struggling under such a heavy burden, he opened the mantle to see what she was carrying. He was even more amazed to find nothing in it but red and white roses, despite it wasn't the season for any sort of flower. 
He took one of the miraculous roses and kept it for the rest of his life, which was to be short-lived. Her charity to the poor was so great that people used to call her Dear St. Elizabeth. Her ladies-in-waiting tried to persuade her not to do so many of the services to the poor that she did, telling her it was beneath her royal dignity. Elizabeth answered, I'm preparing for the day of judgment. On that day, Jesus will ask me for an account of all the good works I've done for him. And I want to be able to say, You see, my Lord Jesus, when you were hungry, I fed you. When you were thirsty, I gave you drink. When you had nothing to wear, I clothed you. When you were sick or in prison, I visited you. Because you said that in doing these things to the poor, I did them to you. So I beg you to be kind to me in the sentence you're about to pass on me. After her husband's death, when St. Elizabeth was but 20 years old, she was cruelly driven from her palace and forced to wander penniless, hungry, and cold in the streets with her little children. Despite her sufferings, which she welcomed and offered up to Jesus as a gift and reparation for her own sins and the sins of the world, she continued to mother the poor and managed to convert many others by her holiness of life. She finally went to a reward at age 24. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about being judged immediately after our death, which will happen to all of us. This is called the particular judgment. However, many people fail to realize there are actually two judgments, the particular judgment immediately after our death, then the general judgment at the end of the world. We'll take a look at the general judgment now. God is both perfectly just and perfectly merciful, and all mankind has a right to see the perfection of both his justice and mercy, which is why there will be a general judgment at the end of time. Everyone will see that in his infinite mercy, God wanted to save us all, and will see that he was right in rewarding those who trusted in his infinite goodness. We'll also see how he was just in punishing those who rejected him with their sins and refused to repent. The same identical judgment will be given in the general judgment as in our particular judgment, because there aren't any second chances after death. In all of sacred scripture, there's only one time that Jesus gives us the criteria for the general judgment. It's found in Matthew 25, verses 34 through 46. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, O come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, and feed thee, or thirsty, and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger, and welcome thee, or naked, and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick, or in prison, and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The church teaches that Jesus meant these things literally, which is why St. Elizabeth did the things she did. I know of a prisoner who became a Catholic while incarcerated. The man who led him to the faith thought he'd benefit from developing a friendship with a Carmelite sister at a mother house here in St. Louis, so he gave the prisoner the sister's address and told him to write to her. The prisoner didn't want to write to her, though. After all, what did a convicted felon have in common with a nun? But he finally wrote, and his letter pretty much expressed his feeling that she couldn't possibly want anything to do with him. 
He posted the letter and promptly forgot it. About two weeks later, he got a letter from the sister. For most of the entire first page, she went on and on and on about what a privilege it was to be able to write to him. The prisoner thought she was nuts, and he expressed this to the man who led him into the church the next time he saw him. That was when the man showed the prisoner the passage we just read. He told the prisoner that in sister's mind, she was writing to Jesus, and she was. Not just in her mind was she writing to Jesus, but according to our Lord himself, she was writing to him, visiting him in prison. The sister and the prisoner developed a very close friendship over the years, and she helped him to persevere in the faith because of it. So the next time you see a workman who's working in the heat and needs a drink, give him some water. The next time you see a homeless person who's hungry, buy him a burger. The next time you drive by a hospital or nursing home, stop in and find someone who could be uplifted by your visit. The next time you notice a poor person or family in need of clothing, gather the things in your closet you're not using and give them to those people. Get involved in a good Catholic prison ministry and visit Jesus in prison. You don't necessarily have to do all these things. You could specialize. Mrs. Sixpack developed the habit of making weekly visits to nursing homes and found ladies she could visit who never had visits from anyone else. Perhaps you could do that, or work in a local kitchen for the homeless, or collect clothing for the poor and ask your priest for the names of people who could use them, because he certainly knows some. Whatever you decide to do, you should resolve to do it now. Your eternal destiny may depend on it. Remember that Jesus said, Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do to me. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Lucy. She said, Those whose hearts are pure are temples of the Holy Spirit. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. A Christian virgin, Anicia, was going to the assembly for Mass one Sunday when she was spotted by one of Emperor Diocletian's guards. Stop! he cried out. Where are you going? Anicia, in fear, made the sign of the cross and said, I am a servant of Christ, and I am going to the Lord's assembly for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I'll see to it that you don't, replied the guard. I'll take you to sacrifice to the gods. He tried to snatch away her veil, and when Anicia prevented him, he drew his sword and plunged it into her heart. The young virgin became bathed in her blood, a martyr to the Sunday Mass observance. It's easy for you to go to Mass on Sunday, but more often than not, it's easier to find a reason not to go. Early Catholics were forbidden under pain of death to worship the one true God at Mass. Yet they made heroic sacrifices to go, many even sacrificing their lives to attend Mass. Try to imitate their zeal for the glory of God. Understand that Mass on every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation is obligatory under pain of mortal sin. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It. 